Culture is behavioral. Culture is the artifact of the relationships that we have. Love your process more. Lead and show what it feels like to love the unfolding. The simplest way to think about the format is input and output. Our job is to be connected to the inputs, to be masterful with the inputs. The outputs will take care of themselves. Okay, O'Neill. This is a highlight for me to be able to do this with you. We're here, we're back, and I'm looking forward to rolling up my sleeves with you because I've said this before, and I'm not sure how exactly it played, but I'm kind of in one of those moods, so I just kind of want to get to it. Okay, well, I mean, last time you were in those moods, we, we had a, a great show, so I, I welcome these moods. Please chin check me if it's a little too strong, but uh, no. I, I, you know, there's just been a lot happening. Like what? If you don't mind me asking. Okay, so we all have a lot of balls in the air, a lot of plates that are spinning, you know, that that's not the thing. It's when there's a lack of clarity that my default is to increase worry. It's all working. Everything's really good. I love the unknown, but when there's not clarity about how things are actually materially going, my default is really clear. Okay. I want to make sure, cause we might be on the same page here. What's your default? No, that's the anxious, like an anxiousness. Like, okay. so I check and I check and I check. Like, ah. okay, well, like, how's that going? How's that going? And wait, has that happened? Has that? So I get really busy internally when ah. that happens. It's a double-edged sword because that keeps me sharp. It keeps me on it. Like, it, it, it helps me be on that edge. But at the same time, sometimes I'm just like, listen, there's no art. Let's get right to it. <laughs> and so today I'm kind of in that mood. All right, re re really fast, two things. Yeah. I, I relate to you somewhat on that. And I want to be, I want to speak gingerly when I say that, mm. because as of late, last week, I've been saying that to people when they tell me something that's going on with them. And then I've been told, oh, you're making this about you. You know, I want to talk about my issue. I don't need you where's to tell Kaisa? me, oh, my. Where, where's Kaisa? Uh, to, to my <laughs> left. <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't say your name. <laughs> yeah. He did. <laughs> yeah. No, because listen, our our partners are. If we are fortunate enough to have a partner that's a truth teller, yeah, that in and they hold up a mirror and they can see you. I hate that. It's the greatest gift, though. Yeah, yeah. I was sharing this yesterday. We had an extraordinary guest. She's been through it, and she went after one of the largest industry companies industry that she's in she went after it she's a dragon slayer as well and her greatest weapon she's one person going against a titan and she was on the on the podcast flat out her greatest weapon if you will to go fight the largest dragon in her industry one person against a complete industry titan as a as a corporation yeah. and she won and so i have such regard and respect for when an individual works with honesty. So those that can hold up the mirrors for themselves, rad. And those of us that <laughs> really value other people holding up mirrors as well, I don't know another way to get to honesty. And so, and cherish those folks. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying, it's a, it's a painful thorn bush filled road. It is. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And that, that idea that like when, if I say to you, oh my good, I just got, it, like I got to talk, I just got in a heavy car accident. And then you go, oh, I feel you. I got in a car accident too. <laughs> it was like three years ago. And boy, I should, have you seen my bumper? I still haven't. <laughs> yeah. No, I just got in a car accident yesterday and I'm trying to connect with you. Yeah. And you're telling me about it. So that's when it's usually well-intended. It's a tactic to relate. Like, yes. oh, I understand you. And yeah. like, here's my experience with it. But what I would want or that person would want in that moment is like, oh, how, what happened? How are you? Oh, I see that you're, you're still kind of shaking from it. You know, like, is there anything I can do? That's what the person wants. Yeah. They want to be seen and understood and taken care of and know that they got a teammate that, you know, has their back. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning that. I'm so, learning so, that. so are we all. Yeah, it, yeah. It's like, I, so am I. It's a tough one. <laughs> All right, let's get to the questions because I don't talk about my problems. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me either. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of insight to me and Dr. Mike. Mm. First question is from Noah. Thank you for these amazing Ask Me Anything episodes. I take away something from every single one. A question I'd love to get your thoughts on is, if you were brought on as a CEO of a new company, what questions would you ask the team to learn about and get a sense of the culture? My experience is when you ask, how is the culture? You don't get a great answer, even if people love it. 
people have a hard time putting their finger on it or identifying it. P.S. Lauren Regula says, is one of my best friends, and I love that you used her story in your book. Oh, okay. So this this question came from a friend of Lauren Regula. Yes. And so we opened the book up with Lauren Regula, one of her deep insights. She's an Olympian and how she struggled with faux pas, fear of people's opinions that almost held her back from going for her for Olympic goals. And so cool that she's friends with Lauren. Yeah. Lauren's pretty remarkable. Okay, so CEO, if I'm a CEO, how do I get a sense of the culture? That's not a hard question. So culture is behavioral. And so culture is the artifact of the relationships that we have. So you bring in a high powered consultant or you get the executive team together and they spend six hours, six days, whatever, distilling down the three words that describe culture. And then they take those words and they print them up and they put them on the hallway and they put them on letterhead and they put them on, you know, an executive brief and, and they share those words with everyone. And the words in the hallways are like, this is our culture. And then leadership gets a little pissed off and frustrated why everybody doesn't know the words. Okay. That's, that's 1980s. That's the old way of thinking about culture. So culture is the artifact of the relationships that we hold. What does that mean? When we have relationships with each other, you can feel something, you can see behaviors. Just like what we were talking about 45 seconds ago, the culture, if, if I were to say that I got in a car crash and then you're kind of making it about you, use the easy narrative here, or tell me about yours, then the culture is like, oh, there's a one-upsman. There's a misguided attempt to take care of each other. Like, so I'm just gonna watch. So if I'm a CEO, I'm gonna come in and I'm going to observe, and I'm gonna use this glow of about six weeks. And my objective would be to down-regulate so that people can feel like they can be themselves, right? Okay, let me, let me actually open this thought up. We can change another person's physiology relatively easily. Okay, so if I give you a certain look, and this is not just you and me, this is like humans. If I give you a certain look and I crunch my frontalis muscles, the muscles between my eyebrows, and I, and I put my chin down and move forward to you and, and roll my, my chest forward, and I make eye contact in a piercing way. So I'm creating some sort of intensity in the moment, right? Using my physiology. I haven't said anything yet. That that can change another person's physiology relatively consistently. And if I open my eyes up and I give you a big big smile, da, 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 that can change another person's physiology as well. So shifting physiology is a cheap trick. And depending on what you say, the speed of what you say, the, the tonation of it, and the body language, that whole package can shift another person's physiology. If you go fast and intense and you got that kind of look I was talking about, people walk around and they think with tension. Okay, There's a purpose. There can be a purpose for that. And there's also a purpose to downregulate to open it up. So if I'm a CEO coming in, I'm not, the last thing that I would try to do is come in with intensity. I wanna come in as a learner and I wanna observe the real behaviors, the real activity that's happening underneath the surface. So to get that to come forward, I need to open up the aperture so that I, I have exposure to the light, to the dark that's actually in the picture. And so that would be, I'd be on a learning tour for the first six weeks and I would look for what happens in hallways and I would watch and you need a little bit of time because all of us can play a game and we can be really clever and smart and show up in the right way for a couple meetings. Yeah. But then I'm looking for follow through. I'm looking for when people, are they walking the talk and talking the walk? I'm looking for when there's a disagreement, how does that happen? What happens post disagreement? Do they know how to repair? Do they know how to hold each other with high regard during that disagreement? Are they afraid of disagreement? So the, the classic transformational arc of forming, storming, norming, and performing, and that Yalom, Yalom did that research a long time ago, it really holds true. So there's organizations that they're either forming, hi, my name is, does that sound like Eminem to you? That's funny that you said that. That's the first fucking thing to pop up in my head when you did that. <laughs> I had to see myself focus. 
you see that? You see that on my face? I saw that. Oh yeah, my yeah, god! Yeah, right. <laughs> I was like, "What image did you pop up?" Yeah, you're on a roll yeah. right now. Yeah, you're okay. in the zone right now. Okay, <laughs> forming. Who am I? The, the, the basic kind of welcoming um, of an organization. Storming is like, okay, we're gonna get to it now. And so, storming the storming phase is really rich with information because some teams and organizations get right into storming and they do it great and it's awesome they know how to hold regard hold the tension you know keep the mission of purpose on point and take care of each other along the way and they storm in the right ways because if i'm a stamp licker and you're the you're you're sending the mail out you need me to lick stamps faster right you need to make sure that they're weighed properly in the right number of stamps on that and you're going to deliver them on time so there should be some tension in between that um Okay, weird analogy, it still holds true. And then the second part of storming is that some organizations are afraid of storming. So I'm seeing, I want to watch and observe, are they gonna go storm? Will they do it in front of the quote unquote CEO? Um, and then how do they storm once they're in it? And so that's a really rich Petri dish of information there. And then once you get through storming, and I'll open that aperture up one more layer, once you get through storming, then you get to what we call norming. This is how we do things. And that's the placeholder for culture. This is how we do things here. But it's not honest unless you get through a storming phase. I don't know if you have my back unless we go into a heavy situation. You can say you have it all you want, but it's not until we go through something together that I know, oh, I know how he shows up. Cool, I'm gonna bet on that again. And then I try it out again and you show up in, in that way that is supportive and encouraging and challenging and there's a bit of an edge to it. I'm like, okay, I get it, cool. All right, I'll do that again. And so eventually over time, that's how we do things here. There's a whole host of things that you can do to increase culture, but it, it, it comes alive during storming. And so you wanna front load all of the activity prior to storming. Now I'm into the application of building culture, rather than the observation of it. But there's a whole host of things that at Finding Mastery and the companies we work with to front load the storming process so that we can do it world-class. And then that establishes the norms. That's how we do things here. And then each time a new person comes in, we have to kind of bring, bring them through that cultural gauntlet so that trust is established, clarity of how things are done are, are uh, observable and, and readied, and then you get into performing and potentially high performing. So I would shorthand, I am going to observe. I'm going to open the aperture. I'm going to downregulate the intensity. I'm not going to ask anybody about what the culture is. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to make sure I, I followed you correctly here. Just be quiet and the culture will, will reveal itself to you eventually, and especially through a rocky time or a difficult time. So, That's what you're saying. Yeah, and if you're if people are really to if there's a timidness to storm and you've given it some time to hopefully you know for the storming to emerge yeah then you might tighten the aperture and increase some intensity to see how it goes ah okay right and so this is not manipulation this is like i need to run an experiment to understand how people work here like i really need to do it if i'm a first person <laughs> driver yeah that it, and we're driving really fast, it's sometimes hard to get the, the full landscape of what's happening and where the corners are and where I need to adjust my speed you know, for the upcoming, I don't know, corner, I guess. But if I can take some breaths and I can float up and I can have more of a meta view, more of a helicopter view, then the intensity down regulates and I can, I can almost drop my shoulders and see what's happening now I, I have the ability to not be so sucked into the thing that I'm floating up. And this is all psychological, right? I'm floating up to get the picture of what's happening. If you and I are arguing and I'm, we're in the argument, m my older self, like when I was a teenager, I'd be in it and I'm trying to defend myself or I'm trying to win. And that's so terrible, right? Because now you're trying to defend yourself and we're, we're doing this thing. We're, it's like we're first person drivers. So as I've spent time in my life, what I'm trying to do 
is be able to be in it, not not have a lack of intimacy, but also take my moments and breaths to come and observe what's happening, like to look at myself, to look at you, to get the whole thing. And if I can float all the way up, like we are two idiots right now, <laughs> you know, like trying to do something that we're taking ourselves so seriously, like calm down, there's like 9 billion people, this plant, this m radical, m miraculous planet has been around a long time. Like, what are we doing? Why are we arguing about the color of something? So, so anyways, the, the idea that I'm trying to articulate here is that I want to be able to observe as opposed to be sucked into it. And that, that I'm not, I'm saying that's not manipulative. That is using a different lens to be able to understand what the culture actually is rather than what the words on the wall say it should be. So I, I just have one question. So culture will almost always reveal itself, right? You, there's almost little to never a time when you have to apply pressure, so to speak, to get it to reveal itself to you, right? Well, the, I was using the new CEO role that maybe maybe the uniqueness of the culture is that they're truth tellers, fire breathers, dragon slayers, and it's on, and you're gonna feel it. Awesome, that is so good. Some cultures might be afraid to get into it because they, they've had it blow up in their face. They've been on a team where there was jerks and the storming was like hostile. And so, so that would be the point where if I'm like not feeling where tension is, and it feels like two people or four people are having a conversation, but they're not really getting to the thing. And they're more concerned about being nice rather than nice and mission driven, nice and kind with purpose. Then that's where I might, I might purposely want to create some sort of heat in that moment to see, do they get to the, to the essence of the conversation or are they staying on the niceties? Gotcha. So that that's where um, there could be a leverage. Gotcha. All right, Noah, there's your answer right there. Just chill, relax. I like how you said, ah, we're moving on now. <laughs> I appreciate well, you, that. You, you, told me, you told me keep it rolling. <laughs> yeah. and, there, there, and there's some juicy questions oh, in here. Okay, good. good man. I'm, I'm, I'm selfish. There's some questions I, I, I want to hear you give the answer to because I'm really curious about a couple of them. Uh, this next one is from Alex. How would you approach a teenage boy who you think has a performance-based identity? He gets jealous when others do better than him. He is so concerned with statistics and what is said on social media. I tried guiding him to focus on the enjoyment of the process and be present, but I don't think that is working. I'm having a hard time with the question because in the teenage years, we don't have our identity locked up. Like that's the time to explore. So identity formation happens up until our 20s, maybe even longer, but classical or classic, um, Eric Erickson's classic developmental stages theory is pointing to like the, the 14, 15 up into the 21 year age, somewhere in that range. I don't know if I have the numbers exactly right in my head right now. Somebody please reference that. But in that identity formation versus role confusion, during that phase, what we are supposed to be doing, according to Erickson's theory, is figuring out who we are. Like, and that, I don't know, for me, it took a bit longer than that. So I was delayed on this arc. So I would like the person asking the question, the first, first part of that I'm struck with is like the identity, this teenager doesn't have their identity baked yet. So I could be totally wrong. Of course, I don't know the person asking the question or the person that they're, they're, they know better than we do. But I'd say, listen, just smile a little bit more. Love your process more, you know, like lead and show what it feels like to love the unfolding, to love the, the process of learning as opposed to performance to take place. So our young people are learning from whom? From the ones that they trust, the ones that other people are trusting. Sometimes it's our parents. Sometimes it's our, you know, who's ever on the cover of a magazine or who's ever in a, in a video. So they're learning. And, and if you have the really important role model position with a young person, it's on you not to ask the questions, but it's more on you to live the life 
that is so aspirational and inspiring to another person that they're asking you the questions. Yeah. That judo, you know, judo throw type of thing. It's like, yeah. how did that happen? Like, oh my God, all that leverage and all that power. Of course you know that. But when you can do that, when they're, when they, so I think leadership is the inner light is so bright that people are naturally attracted. And there's a thousand definitions of leadership. So that one's kind of cute for me, but the inner light is so bright that people are naturally attracted to it. So it's like a moth, you know, or like a something to a flame. And when you get that thing dialed in that way and you get the young people to look at you and they're asking you questions about it, um, the whole thing is different. So I would start there. This question is really, really intriguing to me because with having a, a teenage daughter who plays soccer and is a recruit, loving sports the way that I do and watching, especially, especially high school and collegiate sports. I mean, I was watching the um, the women's Elite Eight yeah. and watching Caitlin basketball. Clark. Yeah, a basketball, watching Caitlin Clark do what she did recently. And one of the biggest things that I saw on social media was how every single person was cooking. I'm talking about going in and cooking Haley Van Lith, who was the, the, the girl that was guarding her, you know? And there's nothing she could do. Every shot Caitlin hit, I was just looking at the comments and just people were commenting. And I was thinking to myself like, man, to be a young person in this day and age with social media, you can't help but to, and I, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm older, and when I talk to my daughter and talk to young people, I'm like, you stay off social media, don't pay attention to the, you know, log get off. Get off my lawn. Yeah, yeah, get off my lawn, get off my lawn. <laughs> oh, I don't care about no damn phones. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I had CDs. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, I walked uphill, <laughs> yeah, well, both ways. About? Both ways, what are you talking about? It's social funny. media. Like, do you feel that that old man on the porch a thing? hundred percent, a hundred percent. I'm trying I, to. How about when you hear your, sometimes I hear my dad in the way that I parent, and I'm like, wow. Like, yeah, it's inevitable. I know. Yeah, it's it's wild. So, anyways, Mike, it's yeah. inevitable that you will wear dress socks and and sneakers and some jogging pants. It's inevitable. That's a sign that you're old. Uh, when you I, got I'm dress socks you did and yeah. loafers and socks and and and, like and sweatpants. Tight, no, yeah. tight pants. Tight pants. Yeah. That, that's a that's a weird phase. Like those, you know, that that I'm thinking about my grandfather who um, World War II generation, epic generation. <laughs> hard shoes socks and like kind of dress slacks yeah while well, mowing like, the lawn <laughs> while well, just doing this gardening you're like how the fuck do they do this <laughs> like what's what what, happening here? what is happening like, they, and they look older back then too yeah so the sweats yeah. is your jam sweats yeah and dress dress socks and you know sneakers yeah, I'm, that's, that, that's sorry, I'm getting older uh, yeah but I try to hold space I've just learned that word by the way you know I'm trying to hold space mm -hmm. I'm trying to hold space for young people because social media is like when I read this question and you know, Alex is, is asking, how do I get around this? If I'm putting myself in his kid's position or whoever this, yeah, his kid's position or a teenage boy's position, whoever, like my daughter's position, how do I not after the game go look at social media? How do I not go see what people, especially if I you, got cooked you, or something you, happened? Yeah, well, you need your leaders to help create the space. When I was growing up, I, I grew up in a place called Burnout Beach. And it earned that name because not a whole lot of people got out of Burnout Beach. Drugs were real. It was a surf culture thing. And I had rich addiction in my family. So I needed an excuse not to get high. And if I didn't have an excuse built in or a way that I, a mechanism, I was so terrified if I picked up a pipe or, you know, rolled something together that it, I was, I knew what the fast track to my family looked like. Alcohol and drugs were like my uncle. I don't even want to go there. Um, tragically. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me bring him forward. My uncle, my favorite uncle, um, committed suicide. And so um, my other uncle died really young. And so I don't know the deaths that you've had, you know, from your family members, but I had radical deaths from from drugs and i saw it all the time so i needed an excuse because i knew that those things were like candy yeah and so what i'm pointing to here is when our coaches create an excuse 
or they create space for what the standard of excellence is, that it gives some kids an excuse. So all I needed was one adult to be like, you're gonna get, you're, you're gonna feel the wrath if you pick up a pipe. You're gonna feel the wrath. And so it gave me a way out, which is like, listen, you guys do what you, whatever you wanna do, I'm not going home. I can't go, are you, like I can't go home. So that type of intensity worked for my family. And so if we can get coaches to hold space, and now I'm going to go way less dramatic, be like, look, put your phones away. There are no phones in the locker room. There are no phones on the bus. Now, once you get off the bus, once we are not part of the, the team environment, no problems. Do whatever you want to do. But when we're together, so my son's coach does this for, for them when they, when they travel for tournaments. No phones in the gym, no phones on the bus. Guess what? They love it. They they kind of him and haw a little bit because you know it's it is an addiction in many forms and it's a form of communication, but it's communicating with people outside of the team. And it's checking to see if I'm okay. And it's checking in with other people to see how they're doing. So she's like, no, 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 we're we're a team, we're taking it away. It's rad. They love it. So we need our adults. Um for our children to create the right boundaries and hold the standard. If not, we are going to pick up the pipe. And one of the modern pipes right now is scrolling and checking and getting that dopamine hit um, as cheaply as it can come. So can, can I ask you a question? Oh yeah. What would you, how would you, if you had a, a child that was getting highly recruited and after the games, after everything, they're in their, after everything has transpired, they're in their bedroom and they're checking social media to see how people are responding, what people are saying to their performance and whatnot. And I, and I could be wrong here, but from what I've heard, you know, colleges check your social media now, which is crazy to me, but they check your social media. You know, NIL deals yeah, there's, there's, are linked to that. How do you how do you comfort them or convince them that, hey, even though you had a, uh, a bad showing, this, that, and the other, you you can't let these outside opinions, these people on the other side of their phones, these evil people in the phones that are trolling you, you can't let that mentally get to you or affect you because you have a, 10 other performances that are, are on the schedule. How do you, yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one, right? Uh, the simplest way to think about the format is input and output. So our job is to be connected to the inputs and help our young people and the people that we are teammates to to be great with or we're leading to be masterful with the inputs the outputs will take care of themselves and so the, the what people are saying about what just happened in your life or what will happen later th that's all output and so it, signal to noise ratio is another framing so it, let's stay with the input output to help your daughter or somebody just understand the difference between the two, and then you are constantly hydrating the inputs, the controllables, and helping her master the inputs. First and foremost, like make it so academic that you just get a piece of paper out and you write down all the things that are 100% under her control, mm -hmm. and do that exercise. It is, it sounds so simple, and you know you might get an eye roll about it, and. And then so you build just the basic categories of the things that are 100% in your control. Thoughts will come up, okay? So thoughts will be one of those categories. And then underneath that, if you were just, if you wanted to double click, you'd say, what are the types of thoughts that work for you? What are the types of thinking patterns that support you to be your very best? What does that sound like in your head? And you get her to write those out. Yeah. And then you can have a discussion about those. And then you can put, what I've, uh, another category is, where I place my attention. So you, you, we want to help her master what's, how she speaks to herself and where she places her attention. And then now you're going to open up a second, you're going to open up this conversation we're talking about. Where does she find challenge in where she's putting her attention? Is it, uh, you bring up somewhere about social media, like I see that you're, you're putting a lot of attention to that. How is that helping column one? A third column will be behaviors or actions. Behaviors and actions are 100% under a person's control. Yeah. And so what are the right actions? What are the right behaviors? What are the right thoughts? And I do write in quotes, meaning that I'm not talking about critical or judgmental. 
when I use that word. I'm not being critical or judgmental when I do the word right. Um, there's the tone from the Zen traditions and Buddhism about right thoughts and right actions, meaning the, the, the thoughts and actions that line up for you to be your very best, to, to be in service of something else, something greater than you. So if you can do what I just said and, and make it super academic, have a conversation about it, that would be a bit of a foundational thing that you can fall back on later when she wants to pull out her phone and you say, hey, um, we're on the bus. We already talked about this, you know, because you've created some boundaries or some agreements with her about, well, where's the right time and the right place to check your phone? And then, so that's input and output, okay? Mm -hmm. Noise signal to noise is a secondary piece here. So the signal is about the inputs and the noise are the outputs. So Super Bowl, when we're heading to our first Super Bowl at the Seattle Seahawks, um, we had not, we didn't have, did we have one player? I don't think we had one player on the team that experienced the Super Bowl. We definitely had one coach, Kenny Norton Jr., who had won it a few times, but we were green. The team was green to the Super Bowl experience. And the team was young. I don't know if you remember the Legion of Boom. Oh, yeah, 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 like, right. So the team was young and it was it was a pack of hyenas. It was awesome. Every part of it, like there was one one of the athletes had a shirt that he would just walk into the into the locker room all the time or to the team meeting room. And it was um, raised by wolves. Yeah. Was, <laughs> like, <laughs> the energy was just amazing. And we're all really young. And the outside noise, the chirping from the outside, from the you know, NFL network, from all the broadcasters were like, ah, you know, experience pays dividends in these quote unquote big moments. They didn't do quote unquote, but that's what they were talking about. Yeah. Experience and like, you know, sometimes you just gotta have to know what it's like to fight through and when it gets hard and will these young guys have what it takes to, and we use that for our advantage. Masters, best in the world, they use everything to move themselves or their teammates forward on the purpose that they're in. They use they use the they use every, all of the resources they have internally, and they use their external environment, and they gather those two pieces of of um, fabric together, and they stitch it to to be in pursuit of the performance or the purpose or the mission at hand. So substandard to that is man, y'all hear what. Such and such has to say about whatever, man. What, what do you think? And they're they're concerned or they're worried about it. So they've they've got sucked into the external noise that is not controllable, that is um, creating some doubt or some trepidation or something inside. Yeah. Or or they use it and they're like they use anger, like man, bang 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 that person, yeah. and they use it as an anger and a fuel. Mm -hmm. So so I'm not suggesting that that is. A better alternative mm -hmm. that is responding to an external stimulus in a more favorable way but it is less sustainable anger is less sustainable okay but it's better than doubt and fear so if you if you had to continue on between going into a moment a match a fight a competitive moment and you had three options scared anxious nervous angry pissed off intense aggressive you know like that that type of energy or in the middle poised Flow course, state. Yeah. You want you want that, you want that grounded. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you can't find it because it feels elusive and you just can't quite get your mind and body to settle in in a grounded way in this present moment, which one would you rather have? I'm gonna fucking bring it, or man, I don't know. Which one would you rather have? Uh, I'm gonna bring it. Yeah, yeah. Right. All day, but poise is I, the ideal. ideal. Yeah. Right. And so, if you're if if the less than ideal is presenting as the only option, okay, scared or angry. Most athletes I would I would encourage to to move to anger. The problem with that tactic is that anger is really destructive. Yeah. You know, and anxiety is not destructive to self or others. It's just not performative. It's not facilitating. So this is playing with fire here, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is really playing with fire. And this this challenges every part of my spiritual framing to go into a situation angry because you're actually scared. <laughs> <laughs> because you can't find the way to be honest and poised to just be you in the present moment. I'm not sure how I got here. No, I, 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 I'm following <laughs> everything you're saying. So, so correct me if I'm wrong. So what you're saying is use it as data 
and use that data, right? That that whether that data is negative comments and whatnot, as a poised, as a as a poised, as a poised, as opposed to it's a good word, <laughs> letting it activate extreme anger in you that can be destructive or extreme anxiety, which is non-performative, right? Use it. Don't take it personally and just use it as data to then grow or become more performative. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I, but the first framing is signal to noise. That's noise. Yes. And so we would use it when the, when the commentators were saying whatever about us, we would use it and spin it, right? Like, but the way that we would spin it is we'd say, first, that's noise. Secondly, they don't know what's in the locker. They don't know. They're not in the building. They don't know. They don't know. How can they know? They're entertainers. They're trying to create stress and tension and they're yes. trying to bring eyeballs and like their job is to be a critic. And so we come right back to the strong, in this case, man in the arena. Let those cold, timid souls who know no nor victory or, de yeah. or defeat. Like that idea from the man in the arena, that speech is actually just a clip from a 1910 President Theodore Roosevelt's beautiful speech man in the arena but it's a it's a it is an artwork that speech in of itself it's multiple pages is a piece of art that is worth referencing and checking not notwithstanding here is that so we would use the external environment by constantly pointing that that is noise and the signal is what's happening in the building and the the most radical signal is what's happening inside of you you know you we've spent full year on self-discovery, knowing your philosophy, knowing your purpose, knowing the vision that you hold for yourself, knowing the vision we hold for the team, knowing the philosophy of the team, investing in your physical, technical, and psychological skills. We are ready. And, and you can watch and just kind of smile when you hear the external noise. They don't know. Yeah. How could they know? Yeah. They don't, they've never met you. They haven't had dinner with you. They've never been in your living room and they certainly haven't been in this clubhouse. How can they know? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe they're commenting on past behaviors that haven't worked out, but that's their job. Love them up and ignore them. Yeah. You know, it's funny listening to you talk and I'm sure everyone gets a, a, a different feeling gets conjured up from person to person. But if I'm an athlete and there's some bad press about me on social media or whatever. Listening to you say everything you just said right now, for me personally, makes me feel as though, well, damn, would I like to be in this position to get judged? And at least I'm in this position or would I not like to be in this position and be one of the people making comments and whatnot? I'm taking that position of being judged every day, all oh, day. Yeah, so to be the artist. Yes, in, yeah, yes. It's still know, a, a- To have- to, you'd rather have that as your canvas rather than than, the, than being not, the the, yeah. the sideline cri critic. Precisely. Yeah. 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 I think that it's really hard to convey everything we just said to a 15 year old or a 17 year old. Yeah. Even a 24 year old. It's really hard to convey it. So we have to live it. And just like when they when they say when any like if your daughter is observing how you're responding to other per people's comments. And you're like, man, you hear that? Or the constant conversation with you and loved ones are about what other people are saying or doing, then she's gonna be like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah <laughs> me, me too. Like, one. yeah, this is not just for you, that's for me. They're, they have big doe eyes and they are watching more than we think. And they are watching what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, what is uh, consistent and what's inconsistent. They're learning. And so you're, you still have a radical influence. In right. your daughter's life and so lead the way from the inside out awesome all right alex i hope you got something out of that i sure did alex thanks for asking that question man this question is from andrew from canada hi dr javais and o'neill my question to both of you is that i'm a 57 year old married man i love my life and my wife and our two dogs i am nearing the end of my career and looking to start my next path as a dive master there are times I need quiet and time away from everyone. How do I broach it with my partner? Thank you. Andrew Higgins from Brighton, Canada. What, what do you think that means? How do I, how do I, how do I enjoy what? Uh, time alone. How do I, I, 
the way I read this is he's trying to figure out how do I break it to, you know, my loved ones, my wife, that I, you know, I need a little bit of space to do my thing. Grab the attention of your partner and then, you know, hold them by their forearms or their, you know, their triceps in an, in, in an endearing way. Make eye contact. So now you've set the stage. And, and say, say, woman, I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And I was, I was going to say, uh, hey, listen, I just need time alone. Yeah. You know, right. <laughs> That's pretty brave. It, None of those, neither of those are going to work. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I just need time alone. I need time by myself. I need time by myself. I'm going to go to the depths of the sea <laughs> because that's what I need. That's what I thought when I, when I read this. I was like, damn, you're going, you're going pretty far to get some time alone, <laughs> yeah, playboy. Right, yeah, right. You might have some other things going on. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. How would you, how would you, for real, how would you respond? All right, without, without the humor. Or, or, yeah. yeah. Um, Andrew, with, I just, this was just funny, Andrew, that's all. No, no, love you. Shout out to you. I, I mean, I just, I, I think involve both of us. I would say, hey, you know, we're a unit and I love you. And obviously we do everything together. But in order to be the best person that I can be for you and in order for you to be the best person you can be for me, we do need to have the things that we love to do. We can't be around each other 24-7, right? You know, I'm, I'm going to go dive at the, <laughs> the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> Maybe you take up knitting. I don't know. Or, or, oh or, or, or oh my a, God. a track run club. I don't know. Run clubs are popular. Yeah. The, the, more, the more, most important thing is my love is that we have our things that define us that we can go to. And then we come back and then we can have a great conversation about it. You tell me about the run club you joined. I tell you about the Mariana Trench. You know, yeah. I, I, <laughs> that's a good you know? reference. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good reference. Huh? Uh, yeah. But, this, this is tricky because there's, there's likely at whatever stage. Um, the relationship it is there's some grooving that's already taken place you know and so let's go small and big for a minute so the small part of this is let's say that in your relationship you take out the trash and okay. let's say your partner organizes the you know refrigerator cleans the refrigerator whatever, whatever. like there's some ha there's some chores or some activities that you've been doing for like five years and she's been doing for five years so there's this groove and, you know, it doesn't just because the groove has worked at one place or one time doesn't mean that it always has to be that way. And you might get tired. I might get tired of taking out the trash or she might be tired of doing the, the, the chore that she's doing. So, but making that change is hard, especially when it's bigger and it's going to take time. And so time away from the family. So there, there is a, an important navigation of it. And it's like changing career, wanting to change a religion, you know, changing like uh, uh, your hobby. Like these are not, those are not all of equal intensity, but there, <laughs> there, there is like something underneath the surface that is jarring for the other person. All that being said is if you do it in the, in the partnership way that you just said, I think it's, you, you give yourself the best chance to keep growing and you've made an agreement to be a good partner. And I'll tell you a funny story. My wife, you know, she she's concerned about how I push edges, like rightfully so. Meaning, push physically, edges. emotionally, ah, like okay, you yeah. know, she's like rightfully so. I, I one of the things I really want to do is I, I want to get my pilot license. Not a big deal, but to her it is. I really want to do it. And so Grayson was just born. Our son was just born, and um, it was bad timing for me, you know, like she's totally in a nurturing stage and I'm quote unquote, still in a hunting phase, if you yeah. will. And um, so I come home and I think Grayson was probably like two or three years old. And I said, Hey, listen, this is the year. It was the beginning of it. It was like a January. And yeah. I said, pilot license this year. She goes, oh, really? I was like, oh man, <laughs> did I miss the moment here? And she, she says, really? And then she kind of just takes a few steps away and goes and sits down at the couch. And I was like, Where's this going to go? And she says, okay, no problems. I just have one question for you. What do you want to be of the name of the man that raises your son? Wow. <laughs> I was like, what the? And she turns and she just grins and she's laughing. She goes, she goes, come on, give me a little bit of time. You know? And you know how, like, that is not her DNA or philosophy yeah. at all. Yeah. So it was a fun moment that she kind of took the energy out of it, meaning that she is not interested in in that that's not the motive but the idea that like if you die and you leave your son and i here like that's not cool that was a fun way for her to get to it yeah and i, I instead of being like 
yeah, yeah, you know, you're taking away my autonomy and like, I got to do what I got to do. And like, this is something I really want to do. And I was like, oh, let me see her, you know? And so I said, all right, well, at some point in my life, what do you think? Right? Some point it's going to happen. And she goes, yeah. She goes, why don't you wait until he's an adult? For whatever reason, she thinks that that is a very dangerous act to get yeah. a pilot to, to fly. Um, driving is more dangerous, as data would suggest. Mm -hmm. So. Did you hit her with that? <laughs> I did. It doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, okay. it, it, it's it's a thing. It's a it's another thing. Yeah. So you know, I bought my. We, we made an agreement on some time, and and I'm cool with it. She's cool with it, and so probably when he goes to college, you know, is when I'll start doing my flying. So. You know what's so funny about this this question is the first thing I thought about when I read it was like, okay, he's going through this new transition in his life and he's trying to reinvent himself in some way, shape or form. And I applied it to myself and I probably would have reacted like you said the wrong way. Like, oh, I'm, tr I'm trying to do something with myself. I'm trying yeah, to become right. something. I'm trying yeah. to evolve and you stop yeah. me from evolving. I'm yeah. trying to, you know, yeah. because there's that fear that if I don't do this now, I'll never do it. And then if I never do it, I may, depending on my mood, hold you responsible. You know? Oh, yeah. I right. may be eating dinner and looking at you Reset, like, yeah, I could have been yeah. flying, diving in the Mariana Trench, now eating peas and yeah, thank right. you, baby. You know? Yeah. Right. So I'm running. Yeah. I didn't want to run. This <laughs> is what you wanted. This is what you wanted. So, I mean, so how do you reconcile? I mean, do you sit down with your partner and say, hey, before we just connect, when I turn 57, I might want to dive at the bottom of the ocean. I don't want you, you know what I mean? I I, I, I want to have room and space to evolve. Yeah, yeah. I don't want you to look at me like, oh, that's the same O'Neal. Oh, just be you. I'm just so used to you doing what you do. Well, that's, is that fair? Yeah. I mean, I love how you bring this up because it really honors shared growth. And the resentment bit is toxic, as we both recognize intellectually. Mm -hmm. But so having a partner is, if it's, convenient for one person and inconvenient for the other all the time it's not really a partnership yeah you know and so yeah i, I think it, it just honors um, the conversation needs to honor the future arc and growth and dreaming together as opposed to hey i got this thing and um it's not something that i want to do with you and i'm going to do it solo whether you like it or not like that's not that's not going to fly right yeah, so yeah. and then i would also dig into like you know, why, why are we having to have a, like a confrontational type of, and I'm going back to the question. Yeah. Why are we having to have this confrontation about it? What about the 15 steps ahead before that, that nurture the relationship for both people to grow? That's where the, this question is, has missed, let's call it 95% of the work. So the question is like, how do I, how do I, you know, how do I get it over the line? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then the 95% of the work is having a relationship and a partnership where you're constantly bringing ideas forward and thinking about your, your think about your retirement together. Think about like what the golden years are thinking about all the future in a way that is so compelling and rich and understanding for the other person. Now, if the other person is like, so let's say that you and I are in a partnership and I know, I know what you really want to do. And, and I want to support you in those. And you know what I want to do, and you and I feel that you're going to support me in those. That we run the risk of moving away from each other, but if we feel supported and connected, it will hold us together. I mean, yeah. if you're going to spend four hours, you know, uh, three hours a day diving, I'm making that up, twelve hours a week diving, and I'm going to spend twelve hours a week of running. Well, okay, that was our twelve hours to spend time together. So how is this going to work? Here, it's a felt sense that. I can't wait for you to go explore. That's going to be awesome. My father-in-law shared this really nice insight when, when I got, it was uh, the day of my wedding, our wedding. And he said, you know, relationships are like light logs and kindling to burn a hot, bright fire. And if the logs are too heavy, the fire smolders. It will never be what it could be. So have enough air in between each of the logs so that your fire together can burn brightly. That's awesome. Yeah, that is it. So, so how do you create that space to support the other person to, to do their thing to their best abilities? Another analogy that was shared by him as well is like, you know, life is kind of in life and relationships is kind of like this. You go out and you gather a bunch of sweets and candies for the day. You bring them back and put them in the jar. 
She goes out, gathers a bunch of fruits and vegetables and sweets or whatever, and puts them in the jar. And then at the end of the day, you're like, oh, look at that. Oh, that's an interesting one. Where'd you find that one? So we go out into the world, we collect whatever. We, he was using the analogy of a candy dish. Yeah. Right? And and you bring the candy back and then you celebrate what the find is. Yeah. But that, that simplicity is just awesome. I think about that framing a lot as well, wanting to celebrate what my partner has experienced. Yeah. Today. So I guess those conversations just need to be current and happening all the time rather than me just popping up out of nowhere and saying, hey, I'm going to yeah. get a ticket to the moon. You yeah. Know, or, or, yeah. And uh, then yeah. why not? Also, I mean, maybe maybe your partner doesn't like water, and so it's an obvious thing. But like, yeah. hey, you ever think about like, I've been thinking a lot about diving. You know, I'm so inspired by it. Like, you ever think diving for you too? Like, maybe it's something we could do together. And if the answer is obvious, then obviously you don't go there. But yeah, just you know, kind of slide, slide in there. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, right. you think about going to the moon. Yeah, right. Man, listen, I could we could go on all day because like, these questions, I I always find something going on in my life with these questions that something will be answered for me. Yeah, so I'm, cool. I'm selfish when I read these questions because I'm like, okay, I can you know apply this to something that's happening with me. And I appreciate it too because wrestling them down forces me, it's a forcing function for some clarity. You know, it's it's a fun way to pull some research into it. Like Yalom, you know, we mentioned the four phases of, of team development, but, and it it forces me to, to wrestle with concepts as well. And it, I, I hope it doesn't come off like I got it buttoned up. Cause that is not the case. No, nah, no. Nah, when yeah. you're in these moods, I love when you're in these moods. Okay. I don't. Yeah. Want, I don't want to rap right now. I, I love when you're in these moods because you go. Yeah. You know. As a matter of fact, let's 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 just grab some food after this and talk more. Yeah. Let's go. No. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Dr. Mike, I appreciate you. I appreciate you more. Thank you. Thank you. Did it have to be a competition? Did you just have to one up me? Did it again? <laughs> God. Uh, thank you for appreciating me. Being appreciated feels good. <laughs> I love you more. <laughs>